Okay, um, we are going to get started with our last presentation. Um, so if you would find your seats or at least, shh. Um, our last presenter of the day is Luke Channel. Um, we'll see what he's gonna talk about. Uh, he is an associate professor of automotive restoration. That sounds really fancy until, you tell, until I tell you I have the same title. So that's, you know, <laughs> sorry, Luke. <laughs> Um, yeah, 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 pretty much. Um, time served. Um, uh, he teaches drivetrain and chassis restoration. Um, he has a long interest in Model T Fords. Uh, he started Midnight Coil Repair, which may be uh, familiar to some of you, in uh, July of 2020. He's rebuilt over 400 coils since then. Currently owns a 1920 Model T Ford that um, has uh, many, many miles on it, and a 1923 Buick. Uh, well, thank you for coming. I'm glad to see a uh, number of familiar faces. I've presented at the clinic once before and come for many years, and uh, it's a really great event. I'm glad, glad people are still doing it. Um, so I, I d debated on what to talk about uh, for this particular clinic. Um, I think kind of with this em particular emphasis on driving and maintenance and that sort of stuff, um, I picked a topic that I think gets neglected quite a bit. Uh, so at the college, I teach chassis and drivetrain restoration. So I do transmissions and rear axles and brakes. Uh, and I also do steering, uh, steering and suspension. So from my standpoint, I think on a Model T, one of the things that gets neglected or not thought about a lot is the front axle. Uh, and the reason for that is it's just plain dead simple. There's just not, or there doesn't seem to be a lot there. Uh, and so usually, and I would say if things are pretty close, the car drives reasonably well. Uh, and most people don't pay it a second thought. You know, there's all those other things to pay attention to, like the coils and the transmission and, you know, all this other wacky stuff that's kind of different and unusual. Um, so I thought, again, I, I'd go through the front axle. Um, and this, this conversation is going to be really based more around a car that's up and running that has had the axle rebuilt. Um, I'm not going to go into all the various details of rebushing everything and fixing all that stuff. Um, I would highly recommend to you the Model T Ford Club of America book on the front axle. It has a really uh, very excellent detailed description of all the procedures and all the kinds of nuances that are involved with the bushings and spindle bolts and tie rods and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so this is going to be, again, more about kind of maintenance and adjustment uh, of the front axle. Um, so the first place that I start, and again, I would say I'll have time for questions at the end, of course, but if you have questions, feel free to ask uh, as I'm going along. So the first place that I always start in diagnosing any chassis complaint is tires. Uh, tires are, are by far the most common issue that you run into uh, with any car, and so the best, best strategy is always to try and sort out vibration, noise, harshness uh, by looking at the tires and determining uh, if, if something's going on there or not. And so the question is, is really twofold on Model T tires. One is, should you balance them? And then two, how do you balance them? Um, and I would say, you know, we drive these cars today at, at essentially the upper end of their speed limit. You know, 35 miles an hour is, was kind of the, the higher end of the design limit, um, which is what most of us run typically. You know, when you have rock stoles and hopped up engines and stuff, of course we go faster. Um, most tire balancing, assuming things are reasonably close, most tire balancing really has a, a much stronger or better effect kind of at above that 35 to 40 mile an hour threshold. Um, but particularly if you drive a lot and you have a car that you, you want to ride smooth and, and uh, handle well, it's not a bad idea to think about tire balance. So of course, modern cars, we typically will dynamic balance the tires. Uh, and for a couple reasons I'll talk about here in a minute, that's not really necessary on a Model T Ford. Um, the thing about our Model T Fords is that uh, even the, the later wheels, you know, the, the uh, 21 inch, four and a half inch wide tires, they're not all that wide. And so uh, if you think about balancing something, for instance, if you want to jump over to me, you can here. So I'm gonna, uh, what I'm gonna do on Chris's car here is I'm just gonna jack up this driver's front wheel. And what you're gonna see is if I give that a gentle spin, you're gonna find that probably, uh, Chris's car seems to be pretty well in balance. Yeah? 
Good job, Chris. The driver does not. There we go. So there it's rolling towards a heavy spot. Um, I didn't take the, the precaution of doing that or the advanced step of doing this, but one of the things you can do, first of all, is to uh, clean out the bearings so there's no grease. Uh, and even just lightly oil them a little bit to reduce the friction even more, and then back the wheel bearing nut off even more than that, you know, to provide less friction, uh, less rolling rotation. So if I did that and then rotate the wheel and found that it stopped, yeah, you can see there it's moving on its own. I would find then where the heavy spot is, which would be roughly right here on the bottom of that wheel, I could then add some weight uh, via some method on 180 degrees from there and continue and adjust my weights until you get the wheel to stop at a random rotation every single time. Uh, that's going to put you in what, what we would call static balance. And uh, so the reason to call that static balance is, is, as opposed to dynamic is this. If I had a wheel that was significantly wider, you know, a modern car tire that's this wide, I might put the weight over on this inside lip of the tire right here while the imbalance on the tire might be clear over here. What that's gonna do then is as the wheel dynamically rotates, it would cause this inside portion to, to wanna hop up and down, as well as the outside where I've now added the weight, you know, in, in exactly kind of the wrong position. It would, it, it, uh, it would introduce what's called a secondary imbalance. Now, the nice thing is because our Model T tires are so narrow, you know, there's just not enough spread to where dynamic balancing is really necessary. Uh, so by just adding some weight somewhere in the middle of the wheel, you're close enough, work just fine. Uh, if I can go back to my slides, please. Uh, so you'll see in the case of this 26, 27 wire wheel, uh, what someone has done is to add solder uh, to the spoke of the wheel uh, for the weight. And that, that's a fairly effective solution, just some lead solder wrapped around the spoke. Um, you know, it's obviously visible, but not that noticeable, uh, provides a reasonable weight, it's easily adjustable. Um, you can make you know, adjustments on the fly. Now, the, there are other ways of doing it uh, using weights, particularly on non-demountable wheels like Chris's. It's kind of challenging because of course there's no easy way to stick a weight short of just using like a tape weight on the inside of the wheel. Uh, and they're, they're kind of ugly to be honest with you. Um, if you have demountable wheels, you can actually remove the rim off the tire, stick some weights like on the inside of the demountable rim, assuming you can get it back over the fellow or the felly, depending upon your pronunciation, uh, and potentially get them balanced that way. So there are a number of solutions um, to that. The other kind of method that's come on the market in recent years that I like a lot, I was pretty skeptical of it, to be, to be honest with you, at the beginning. Um, but I've since tried it and really appreciate it. Um, there was a company called Dynabead, there still is, a company called Dynabeads, and uh, they developed a system whereby you can fill tires with uh, glass beads, es essentially. And then what happens is as the tire spins up, the beads naturally rotate in the tire to offset the heavy spot in the tire. So it's effectively like dynamically balancing the tire every time you drive the car. Um, and so I have a set of those, and I will not show them exactly to you, but uh, they come in a nice little package here. They come in, uh, so Dynabeat is the original uh, company. There since have been uh, a number of knockoffs. Uh, these ones are uh, Counteract, uh, which I found significantly cheaper, uh, always a nice quality. Uh, and you can see the kit comes with a little bottle, uh, a little core remover, and uh, most importantly, on the inside, I'm gonna hope. Comes with a tube for filling into your tire. And then there should be, I just ordered these on Amazon. Uh, so you'll see the beads right there. Well, kinda of hard to see, but yeah, glass beads, right, like so. And then the most important thing that's in these kits um, is a, set, a spe uh, set of special valve cores. So unlike a conventional uh, valve core, you can see these have this little uh, uh, nub on the end. And what that does is that when you deflate the tire, it keeps the glass bead from getting caught in the core and causing a tire leak. 
So by running those special cores uh, and the glass beads, you can get effectively dynamic tire balancing uh, whenever you want. And the nice part of it is it's invisible also. You cannot see it on the outside of the wheel. Um, so I had, the reason I got converted over to Dyna beads or the glass bead system, um, I bought a pickup truck and it didn't have, I mean, well, one, I'm really bad about balancing my own tires. I have the equipment and can use it whenever I want and I still don't do it, right? Because, you know, when you have the access to the equipment, that just means like you're just never, you know, it's like, well, I can do that tomorrow. And then you never do it, right? So anyway, um, bought this pickup and I thought, boy, this thing rides really smooth. Uh, went to change the front tires and I found the Dyna beads in it. I'm like, well, there we go. And so at that point I became a, a Dyna bead or glass bead balancing uh, convert. So I picked up this kit on Amazon. Uh, I'll probably use it for one of my cars. This is uh, recommended for light cars, three ounce, uh, four packages of three ounce beads, and then the applicators uh, as well. So a nice solution uh, to balancing overall. You always put the whole package in? Uh, so they provide different size packages for different size tires. Uh, and so for heavy truck tires, I think it's five ounces. Um, Dynabead or the other bead manufacturers typically have recommended weights for different size, or recommended, you know, sizes for different size tires. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Have you ever use a, a uh, bubble balancer for those water wheels? Um, I have one here, and I have not used it for those, but I, I've certainly done it. Um, well, you can see that's what they're doing here. Uh, what this gentleman's referring to is a bubble balancer where you have a point that comes up and then there's an arbor that sits on there with a bubble level in the center. So that bubble level, <clears throat> if the wheel's off balance, will naturally tilt that way. And so you get the bubble centered. Oh, need my PowerPoint, Bill. So you get this, uh, this glass you know, bubble centered right in the middle of it uh, by adding weight one way or another. And yeah, those work uh, very well. Instead of wrapping the spokes, we've got these adhesive flat lead weights that go on the inside of the wheel. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, adhesive weights do work quite well. Um, so yeah, there are a number of ways to skin a cat. But I think Harbor Freight sells bub bubble balancers now for 30 or 40 bucks. Yeah, do, do they? Yeah. yeah. Other questions? Okay, well, let me move on to my next slide. So assuming you got some type of tire balancing piece done or at least thought about, um, the next things to think about are alignment angles. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about what I call the three primary alignment angles, which are camber. Uh, let me write these up here on the board. So we're going to talk camber, caster, and then toe. There are some other alignment angles out there, um, but typically in your standard average alignment, these are the three that are adjusted, and these are the three that are, are really talked about in the Ford manuals. So what you see here uh, is camber. Camber is simply put as the wheels either lean in or out at the top, uh, that's gonna be either positive or negative camber. So you'll see a stock Model T camber should be set uh, to a positive, in a positive nature. Uh, the Ford manuals call out three inches of difference in the overall tops between the tops and the bottoms, which is kind of honestly a very unusual way of measuring it. It's not really done that way in any other instance that I'm aware of. Um, if you do the calculations, this comes out to two degrees positive camber. Um, and, and so the, the question is like, first of all, Model T alignment specifications are just crazy. There's no like they're way different than modern cars and the, kind of the question is why. Um, so you're gonna see that that positive camber does a couple things. Of course, leans the tops of the tires out. A and if you look at modern cars, they typically run negative camber. Uh, that is the tops of the tires leaned in. That negative camber uh, does a couple things. So by cambering the wheels, say, out at the top like so, uh, what you're gonna find is that they tend to roll on a cone shape. And so if you think about that cone, it would taper down to an imaginary point out somewhere about here, right? So if I've got one positive cambered there, positive cambered there, I'm gonna have those two cones kind of rolling out apart from the car. 
So on modern cars, we use negative camber. And the reason being, or one of the reasons being, that those cone shapes then would come and essentially align right in the center of the car. And so naturally, that's going to stabilize the steering, right? Because they're both going to want to push together and keep the steering wheel in the straight ahead position. So again, why would you run positive camber, right? And especially such large amounts. The other thing that you're going to see by running large amounts of positive camber, as we see on Chris's car, is this kind of characteristic behavior here. You're going to see that that tire has scrubbed off um, from the outside edge to the inside. So we've got a decent amount of tread left on the out, uh, very inside edge, but not so much on the outside. So we get undesirable tire wear. We get, you know, maybe not the best steering. Um, and, and I'll point out to you later, on the later cars, on the 1926-27 cars, Ford actually changed the spindles. Uh, so the camber on a Model T is set in the, in the angle of the spindle where it comes out of the spindle body itself. So it's physically bent right there. When they went to balloon tires in 26-27, um, they reduced the cam camber angle to about one degree, one and a half degrees, which uh, both substantially improved handling and tire wear. Um, so, you know, a lot of guys like to run the 26-27 spindles because they're a little bit higher. Uh, let me jump to that slide here. I've got a nice illustration of this. Can I get my PowerPoint, Bill? Uh, there we go. So here's an uh, illustration of the difference between a 26, 27 spindle. So you'll see that uh, not only is the, the spindle shaft higher up, giving you a lower you know, overall uh, ride height, but also the camber angle is slightly less, again, about one degree for kind of improved tire wear. So again, I go back uh, to this question, why did Ford run so much camber? And I struggled with this for a long time. Here's the reason why. Um, there's a, what I'd call a secondary alignment angle known as steering axis inclination. And that steering axis inclination is as you look at the kingpin, or what we call a spindle bolt on the Model T, you're going to see that that spindle or that kingpin is straight up and down, right? So what happens then is as the wheel moves through its uh, steering arc, you're going to see that um, by turning that wheel, I'm, bleh, I'm struggling to explain this. I need my slide. So what's, what's going to happen is if you draw a line straight down from the kingpin here and then a line, line straight down from the wheel, going to see that there's a distance in between those. And, and what happens is as you turn the wheel through that range of motion, the tire tread has to actually scrub a little bit on that distance in between the line of the kingpin and the line of the, the, the wheel assembly coming down. By running positive caster, by running this outer portion of the tire, uh, the top portion of the tire outward, it reduces the scrub radius substantially uh, and makes the steering easier. Now, Later on, in the late, like mid-1920s, 26, 27, somewhere around there, um, they discovered that by running steering axis inclination, that is angling the kingpin this way, what that does is it moves the scrub radius and reduces it without having to run those huge amounts of positive camber. And as a secondary effect, uh, running steering axis inclination like this means that uh, you don't get the lever effect that front brakes might have, right? So without front brakes, this all kind of works pretty good without any steering axis inclination. You add front brakes on there, and then the unequal power of the brakes can cause a car to pull one way or another uh, by adding steering axis inclination and going to essentially a zero scrub radius, it gets rid of all that. And so maybe that was a little bit deep in the weeds for you. If it's not, I'm fascinated with that question because it took me forever to figure that out. So are you saying that kingpin uh -huh. is in a vertical plane? It is in a vertical plane on a Model T, yes. So the camber angle then comes from how the shaft comes off the... Exactly. It is built into the spindle itself. Yes. Other questions or clarifications? Do us a favor and put that jack handle back in there. Uh-huh. Oh, come on now. Safety last, my friend. 
Other questions? Okay. Okay. Uh, so the question is, how are we going to? So, like, how do you measure this whole camber thing, right? Uh, and so I, I have a nice solution. I struggled for a long time at the college to figure out exactly how to do alignment because we get this wide variety of cars and alignment rack takes up a lot of space, it's inexpensive, and it's like one week of class, so I don't really want a $40,000 alignment rack that I use you know, twice a year. So I really tried to come up with a solution that would be both practical in a, a restoration shop, not take up a lot of room, uh, and also be economical so that you, know, you can do this stuff on your own. So I discovered that the racers, uh, you know, dirt, circle track, oval track racers, uh, use the old way of doing it, which is a camber caster gauge like so. And so this is a, essentially a fancy bubble level. Um, and it's got a magnetic uh, uh, end on it right here. And so that end, in turn, uh, what you can do is basically snap it onto the hub of a car uh, and then take your readings from there. Now, it got a little bit complicated when it comes to Model T stuff <clears throat> in that um, you're going to find that my magnet, uh, the magnet on it is not deep enough to actually sit on there. So yesterday I spent a little bit of time on the lathe and I made up an adapter ring uh, to go on my magnet. I was hoping that my magnetism would pass through enough that it would stick to the hub. Not quite, but it's close enough to where I can hold it up to get a camber reading. So I'm going to let the weight off my jack, just so I've got, you know, the rule is you always align cars at their normal ride height. So then what I'm going to do is stick my camber gauge on, and I'm going to hold this up again for my beautiful assistant, if you can show that off. I want to show off the level function here. Okay, so I'm going to have a couple different bubbles to pay attention to. The first of these guys is going to be right down here. What I'm going to do is tilt this thing back and forth until I get that bubble right in the center of the level. Then from there, my camber scales are on the outside right here. So this side is positive, this side is negative. So one side is going to be clear up, probably the negative, probably clear up here above the zero, and then I'll take my reading on the positive scale right here. So I'll stick that on there, hold it up to my spindle nice, you won't be able to see this. I'll get it good and level, like so. And I am at, right there, one and three quarters degrees uh, positive camber. So pretty close to the Ford, Ford specification. So then let me check the other side. And we'll see where we're at here. So again, I'm gonna center up my bubble. And right there, I am at three and a half degrees positive camber. <laughs> so, so Chris had wondered for a long time why this tire always wore funny on this car. And there's your answer. Now, um, so the question is, what are we going to do about that? Because as you can imagine, uh, if the camber is set by the angle of the spindle, right, the only way to fix that is to bend parts. And, and so the answer is that it's not necessarily going to be in the spindle itself. It's more likely to be in the axle. So particularly uh, you know, from chaining down Model Ts in the center of the axle, um, pulling on them, yanking them. I mean, these things typically lived hard lives, right? Uh, it's very, very common to see axles that are slightly bowed, dished, bent, you know, pulled forward this way or that. Um, so you're going to have to bend the axle is what it comes down to. Typical uh, method. I'll get to you in just a sec, Steve. You're going to have to straighten the axle. Gonna, well, very true. Yes, you're going to have to unbend the axle. Um, so you could do that in a press. Of course, take the axle out, you know, take care of it that way. Um, the other way to do it, which Steve uh, Bender and I were just talking about, is to chain both ends uh, and then put a jack in the, in the center to get the, ca the camber reading where you want it. So it just takes some fussing and some playing. Um, the Ford steels are very easily moved. Uh, they're typically very, very ductile. They don't crack or break or any of that stuff. You don't, I try not to bend things unless I have a specific purpose, but they're pretty easy to move around if you need to. So um, that's that. 
Okay, questions on camber. Your, your gauge, is that measuring total or one side? So if you yeah. had the exact same negative on your gauge on both sides, would you have those together to then equate that to the Ford specification? Well, the Ford specification, as I say, is just crazy. Like nobody measures it that way. Camber is measured per wheel. So and it's your two degrees is then one side, not total. Yeah, so if you were to do the, the quote unquote total, it would be four degrees all overall. Yes, Steve. Um, I, I would like to point something out. Yeah. That's okay. Um, you're using the bubble there, and that's relative to gravity. And you want to make sure your, your vehicle is on a level surface. Yes. Two degrees over there could be because you got two degrees of angle. Absolutely. And yeah, that is a very relevant point. Um, there is also a caster function that you can use on that by doing a sweep. And when you do that, you have to make sure that the rear is jacked up so that the vehicle's level. Yeah. I know the floor in here is, it's not perfect, but it's pretty close. And so I just rely on that. I just, so in this case, where it's bent on this side, if you, how would you go about then? Would it, you, does that mean this side is the side that's bent and you need to straighten it? Yeah, so probably what I would do is probably chain it down somewhere in here uh, and then go ahead and jack up right over in that vicinity. And again, you just kind of have to play with your setup until you get it right. Yeah, There's no, place to start, yeah, it? exactly. There's no, you know, if you knew how it was, how it got bent yeah, originally hard, then, hard. then, <laughs> but given that lack of information, it's kind of, kind of a guess as you can. Okay, other camera questions? Yeah, one in the back there. I'll show you that here in a minute, and I'll show you what that tool's for. I saw one other question. We'll take one more. You can use a square, uh, and what you can do is take and uh, interpolate a measurement. Uh, typically from the fellow of the wheel is where they, they determine from, come out to the edge and you should have you know half of that three inches. So you should have an inch and a half of distance down here at the bottom. In practice, I find that's pretty hard to, to get exactly right, but you, it, with enough messing around with it, you can get it done that way. One more. You may know this, you may not, but maybe Chris does. We had, we straightened out a lot of axles, but we had one that it would always spring back to where it was. Now, I don't know, it was an early axle, I don't know what the metal content was, but that thing would, ever, would go right back to where it was. You just couldn't bend it. I have a whole lecture on metallurgy. We can talk later. <laughs> okay, okay, let's go back to the PowerPoint there for a minute, Bill. Okay, so our next angle we're gonna talk about is caster. Uh, so our caster is the tilt. So we talked about you know, steering axis inclination and all, the, all this stuff. Caster is the tilt of this kingpin as it leans either uh, backwards, typically, or forwards, not typically. Uh, and what that does is it causes the spindle, as we look out here, to travel in an arc either like this, you know, kind of on an angle like so, or on an angle like this. So if that uh, caster axis is leaned back, what you're gonna see is that uh, as the force of the road pushes the wheel back, it's naturally gonna have to move it to where it wants to raise the right height of the vehicle, right? So that's naturally gonna bring, assuming it's equal on both sides, that's naturally gonna bring the wheels to a straight ahead position. You'll have experienced this on a shopping cart, you know, they typically have a very high caster angle and wanna follow along with whatever you're doing unless you get the one with the wobbly wheel like I always do. Um, <laughs> but uh, so you'll typically see that we run some degree of positive caster, that is the tops of the kingpins, or spindle bolts if you want to call them that, uh, leaned backwards, again, for that nice, stable, you know, kind of um, self-centering steering. I often get asked the question, you know, on modern cars and such, well, what centers the steering wheel? How does it know to go back to center? And the answer is it's all in the alignment. It's typically all in the caster angles. 
uh, and not so much in the actual steering box or anything else. So um, as I say, my camber caster gauge has a way of measuring that. You use a set of turn plates, and it gets kind of fancy, and there's this stuff involved. We're not going to do that. We're going to use the Ford method, uh, and what I'm going to do is use a framing square. Again, I'm going to depend on my nice level floor, Steve. Uh, and what I'm going to do here is uh, Ford. Let me go back to my PowerPoint for just a second, Bill. Power, yeah, slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so you'll see that Ford uh, calls for this to be leaned back, and the specification is five and a half degrees. Well, if you read the manual, uh, that five and a half degrees equates to somewhere between a quarter inch and five sixteenths of an inch lean back at the top. So if I put my framing square, and I'll let you can switch the camera there, Bill. Yep. And she'll pick me up here. Okay, so you'll see if I take my framing square right here, what I'm going to do is get it flat on the floor. I'm going to touch it to the bottom side of the kingpin, uh, to the spindle on the axle right there. And then this gap up here should be between a quarter of an inch, which I've got a quarter inch bolt here, I can pass that through, and 5 sixteenths. So with a 5 sixteenths bolt, it's loose by about an eighth of an inch. So we've probably got about 3 eighths of an inch caster on that side. And on this side, Yeah, about the same, maybe a little more on that side. So he's essentially overcaster, got a little bit too much positive caster. Um, I would say this, so I just use the bolts because they're nice precision, you know, I mic these out, they're nice and easy, easier, easier than using a tape measure, kind of a nice go, no-go gauge. Um, so Chris is a little bit, as I say, overcastered here. Running a little bit more positive caster than the Ford specification isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's not going to affect the tire wear. It's going to make the steering a little bit more stable. It, it increases the steering effort a little bit because, of course, you have to lift. You know, if I turn the steering wheel, say, this way, you're going to notice that that causes that wheel to essentially travel on an arc like this and raise the car up a little bit. You may even notice it as I, uh, you know, go through the steering motion. Um, so it may increase the steering effort a little bit provide you a little bit more stability, six of one, half a dozen of the other. Um, definitely too little caster is a major problem. Um, if you don't run enough caster, the car is going to be very unstable, and particularly with uh, you know, the scrub radiuses and no steering axis inclination, it will make the car dart considerably. Uh, so it's, it's okay to run a little bit too much, not good to not run enough. So that's that. Questions? There you go. Uh, let's go back to the slides. Um, so here's how you adjust that. Our friend in the back me uh, mentioned a uh, very large wrench that you put on the uh, front axle. And so the typical way to adjust that is you use said tool or some other tool that's equivalent. You hook that onto the axle. You put about a three foot long bar on there and you physically bend the radius rod uh, so that it sets the correct amount of caster on either side. So again, bending parts. Yeah. Uh, typically, the the Ford manual calls to put the wrench like right here, or right here, just right next to that uh, radius rod, so you get a nice, you know, one side at a time kind of adjustment. Yeah. So have you ever done that? I have. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Have, really? Well, I'll get to that in a minute, Bill, because I want to talk. I want to talk about some front-end design changes and such that will affect that. Yeah. Any other questions, caster-wise? I would say caster and toe are the two most commonly adjusted ones on Fords. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, so we talked caster. You can see using the framing square there. That's in the Ford manual. 
there's our spindle differences in terms of, uh, oh, I need to go back. So then um, our last adjustment that we're going to talk about is toe, toe in or toe out. Uh, and so as we look at, the, so this is looking, you'll notice the radiator cap in the center of the vehicle there. Looking from the top, toe in or toe out is whether uh, the wheels are pointed inwards together or in the case of toe out, pointed outwards. And so most of our vehicles are going to run a small amount of toe-in, uh, the reason being that, first of all, it just tends to cause the vehicle to track straighter because it wants to push in a straight line. Uh, the second being that if there's slop in the system, you're going to find that that toe kind of equates or, or kind of uh, equalizes for that, and that you go to essentially a zero toe uh, condition under running conditions. So, uh, so yeah, we're going to run a slight amount of toe-in. Uh, Model T's run a, a fairly standard type of uh, toe-in spe specification between three sixteenths and a quarter of an inch. So on our fronts uh, here, what you're going to find is that the front tread of the tires here should measure a quarter inch or three sixteenths of an inch narrower than the rear. Uh, and so the question then is how do you measure that? Um, and one of the things you want to take into account when measuring this uh, is the run out in the wheels. Uh, I think, again, if you read the Ford manuals, some of them say that, you know, maximum run out on a wheel is an eighth of an inch. If you've got an eighth of an inch stacked up in the wrong direction on both sides and your toe specification is a quarter of an inch, you could be well out of the specification. Um, and so we need to make some compensations for that. And I'll show you how to do that here in just a second. Um, I certainly have set the toe on a number of cars using a tape measure, and that works fine. A uh, little bit fancier way of doing it. Again, I went to my circle uh, dirt track racers and came up with a toe gauge, uh, as you see here. This toe gauge has a couple of uh, nice, nicely machined points on it. What I'll do with those points is, first of all, line them up at the back, uh, on the back side of my tires. Uh, I'm then going to make a chalk mark. Uh, on the tires, roll the vehicle forward until I get that chalk mark to the same height as I was on the back. That'll put me at the same wheel position, front and rear. Uh, and then I'll take my measurement on this side and it'll give me the, the toe in or toe out measurement. So we'll do that. I might actually ask you to assist me a little bit, Steve. So if you could. <clears throat> Let me make one adjustment here. So I've set my toe gauge at zero right there on this one. So come to the center of the tread for me, Steve. And just whoever's doing this with you just has to be consistent where they do it. I prefer the center of the tread. Other people have their own. They do the outside. I don't know. It doesn't matter as long as you're consistent. I'll call it right there. OK. So then let me make a chalk mark. <clears throat> Chalk marks right here and right there. Reattach the bike. Okay, and then if you could help me, Steve, just roll the car forward. One quarter, yeah, we're in neutral. As much neutral as you get, anyway. And then we're just gonna come. I was worried we wouldn't have enough room, and then we do. So then I'm gonna take my toe gauge. I'll have my lovely assistant, Steve. And he's going to center the side that doesn't have the mark on it. And so go ahead and put that in the center of the tread for me, Steve. OK. And yep, we've got a slight amount of toe in. I'm going to gauge it to the center of my tread. And you didn't disappoint me, Chris. So you'll see that I take my measurement right on this gauge right here. I'll let her come over and take a look at that. So if you want to zoom in. So you'll see on my gauge right there, just like me, I'm always out of order. Uh, so you'll see I've got my eighth inch uh, right at my, I'd have to move it, yeah. 
that's my quarter inch mark right there, which is about where I was. So we're pretty close to the spec. I wouldn't bother, I wouldn't bother adjusting it. So um, I can tell you from talking to a number of modern, this is not so much Model T, but talking to a number of modern, I had a, a guy that I, he worked out at the dealership out here and he'd been aligning cars for like 50 years. And so I had a long discussion with him about, you know, what does he do and the tricks and tips and that kind of stuff. And, and his suggestion was that on, if you're running a car with radial tires, they typically need less toe and they benefit from less toe. So while the old books might call for 3 sixteenths of an inch, he would run them down to about an eighth uh, to improve tire life where and they typically would run just fine. So I, I usually try to err on the lower side of the toe-in specifications. Um, toe-in, especially excessive amounts of toe-in, will cause tire wear, uh, very rapid tire wear. Uh, what happens is when you get to, you know, three-eighths or more of an inch of toe-in, as you're going down the road, you're just skating the tires sideways. Um, a quick tip to tell if you have too much toe-in one way or another, uh, is if you feel the tires going one way or the other. Uh, if you feel sharp edges going outward, that's too much toe out. If you feel sharp edges going inward, that's too much toe in. Uh, and so pretty typically I get a car up on the rack, I'll just run my hands over the tires, see if they feel sharp, which direction they feel sharp, and then, you know, get out the toe gauge from there. So. Excellent question. I should bring that. Toe is always adjusted, doesn't matter what the car is, by lengthening or shortening the tie rod. Uh, in the case of a Model T, uh, there's a pinch bolt on the passenger side. You take that pinch bolt loose and the tie rod bolt, screw it in, uh, half a turn or a full turn. So on Model Ts, it can be kind of tough sometimes because you get, you only get a, you know, a turn or half a turn, depending. So it's like you get what you get and don't throw a fit, basically. So sometimes like you get too much on one way and you get too little on the other, so you have to just decide which way you want to go. So they're on time. So let's go back to the slides. I wanted to talk a little bit about some parts differences and changes, things to think about. Um, so I mentioned the spindles between 26, 27 and the camber angle. Uh, the other important thing to know about Model T front axles uh, it's of course the design change made in 1917. Um, Henry Ford was riding in a car, and uh, the front axle folded under, sent him off into the ditch. You know, on the wrong with the oily side up, shiny side down. Uh, Ford wasn't too happy about that, and so they changed the design of the front wishbone uh, to make it safer. You'll see on Chris's 1914. Of course, the wishbone is up above, like so. Uh, that is the less safe design uh, because, of course, any sudden impact can cause the axle to fold under. After 1917, we went to the wishbone uh, below. So um, much safer design. There are about a million accessory braces available uh, for the early cars, period and modern. Um, and I, I strongly recommend one of those, Chris. Um, he does not have one on there. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so, just something to think about. Um, just a couple other things that I might mention quickly. Uh, the caster on a Model T is set in the perches. So if you're putting together an axle, they are non-directional side to side. You can run them either way. Uh, but the perches have to be put in correctly. If you do flip the perches side to side, whether that's by putting them in the wrong side or turning the axle the other way, you get negative caster, not good. Um, so I typically will watch that pretty carefully. Uh, and you know, it's not, if you get a mismatch of parts, you can come up with two perches for the same side, that kind of stuff. You just, you just wanna watch that. Um, the other thing that I did not include in the slides, but that I look at on every single Model T before I get into ride or drive, is that the wishbone cap needs to be safety wired. Uh, reason being that you know, there are castle nuts and studs. If you put cotter pins in there, the studs can back out. So you wind up with a stud and a nut still on it, but nothing attaching the wishbone. And then 
the car goes sideways. So safety wire every single time on those, on those wishbones. What about addressing the wishbone ball socket fit? That also is an important one. You know, if the wishbone isn't tight in there, it can cause the axle to wobble back and forth. Um, you can do a number of wishbone fixes. I, I don't know how deep I want to get into them. I, I personally like the aftermarket APCO, you know, spring-loaded uh, wishbone. You don't care for those, Mike? Okay. We have our differences of opinion. Um, but yeah, addressing the wishbone fit so it's tight somehow is important, whatever method you choose. The other thing that I will say that causes more problems that can be really hard to diagnose um, are stuck spring perches. Um, Model T's came out, or they were designed really before the advent of uh, high pressure grease fittings, and so all this stuff is designed to be oiled, and oiled on a very regular basis. Uh, and especially the spring perches, because they see a relative, uh, you know, they're out there in the elements and they see kind of a relative limited range of motion. It's not uncommon for those to freeze on one side of the shackle or the other. What will happen then is if one of the spring perches is frozen, when the axle jounces up and down, it causes the axle to shift one way or the other, thereby imparting what we call bump steer, which is where uh, the suspension travel actually causes the car to steer one way or another. And uh, it can manifest a number of ways from like darty handling. Uh, the other thing that it'll typically do is cause, um, cause what we call death wobble, right, where the car sets up a vibration that's in the steering wheel and it's terrifying. <clears throat> um, just other general rules should be no more than one inch of free play either way in the steering. Chris's car is relatively tight, as I felt it. There's a little bit in the, in the planetary gears. Not, nothing major to worry about. Um, yeah, yeah. No All right. Um, I said thank you to the committee. Absolutely, thank you to all of you for coming and for, for giving us your day, your weekend, your travel time. Um, it, it, it's because of you that this happens, so thank you for that. Um, and we have just a really uh, thank you to the presenters again, um, Luke Channel, Mariah Bryans, David Liepelt, and Ken Kennedy. Uh, we've got a small gift for them. If you would, just one more round of applause for them and thank them. Thank you.